In the small town of Windridge, hidden deep within a tangled forest, there stood an old forgotten house, Hollow Creek Manor. For decades, it was shrouded in rumors of tragedy and horror, but most dismissed the stories as local folklore. That was until a group of teenagers decided to spend a night there, hoping to disprove the tales once and for all. One of those teens, Emily, would later recount the terrifying events of that night, a night none of them would ever forget. Emily had always been the skeptical one. Ghosts were for horror movies, she thought, and urban legends were just that, stories people told to scare others. Her friends, Claire, Mike, and Danny, had similar feelings, though Mike claimed he was the bravest of them all. It was his idea to break into the old manor. The plan was simple, spend the night inside and record whatever happened. They didn't expect to encounter anything supernatural. They arrived at the manor just before dusk. The exterior was exactly what one would expect from a haunted house. The once grand structure was decayed, its windows shattered, and the paint peeled away like old skin. The front door creaked open with minimal effort, revealing a grand hall that had long fallen into disrepair. Dust coated the floors, cobwebs hung from every corner, and the air was thick with the stench of mold. Piece of cake, Mike muttered as they stepped inside, the door slamming shut behind them with an echo that seemed to rattle the entire house. The group exchanged uneasy glances, but Mike laughed it off. Probably just the wind, he said, his voice carrying a hint of uncertainty. Armed with flashlights and their phones for recording, they ventured deeper into the manor. The temperature dropped significantly as they moved down the hallway, their breath visible in the dim light. Despite it being the middle of summer, the house felt like an icebox. Emily shivered and hugged herself. Does anyone else feel weird? Claire whispered, her eyes darting around the dark corners. Just your imagination, Mike said, though even he sounded less confident now. As they reached the staircase leading to the second floor, they heard it. A soft, rhythmic tapping. It sounded like footsteps. But they were the only ones there, right? Is someone else here? Danny asked, his voice shaked. The group paused, listening intently, but the sound had stopped. Maybe it's an animal or something, he added, though his eyes betrayed his fear. They climbed the stairs cautiously, their flashlights sweeping across the decayed walls. The second floor was in even worse shape than the first. The wallpaper was peeling in long strips, revealing rotted wood beneath. Water stains spread across the ceiling like bruises. As they entered a long hallway lined with doors, Claire suddenly gasped. Did you see that? She whispered urgently, pointing toward one of the rooms at the end of the hall. Emily turned her flashlight in the direction Claire was pointing, but she saw nothing out of the ordinary. What are you talking about? Mike asked. There was a, a figure. I swear, I saw someone standing there. Claire's voice was trembling now. Before anyone could respond, the door at the end of the hallway creaked open. Slowly, painfully, a cold gust of air rushed toward them, carrying with it the unmistakable smell of decay. They stood frozen, staring at the door as it swung wide, revealing a pitch-black room beyond. Mike, trying to maintain his bravado, chuckled nervously. It's just the wind, he repeated, but his voice wavered. Let's check it out. Are you insane? Claire hissed. I'm not going in there. But Mike was already moving toward the door, his flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. Emily and the others reluctantly followed. As they entered the room, the temperature dropped even further and the feeling of dread intensified. The air was thick, oppressive, as though something unseen was watching them. Okay, this is getting creepy, Danny muttered. His eyes scanned the room, landing on a large, dusty mirror hanging on the wall. Let's just film a bit and get out of here. Emily raised her phone and began recording, panning the camera across the room. But something was wrong. As she looked through the screen, she noticed something the others hadn't. In the mirror, a shadowy figure was standing behind them. Her heart raced, and her blood ran cold. She lowered the phone and turned to look behind her, but there was no one there. She looked back at the screen, and the figure was still there. Closer now, just a few feet behind Mike. Mike, Mike, we need to go. Now, Emily whispered, her voice barely audible over the pounding of her heart. What are you talking about? Mike asked, turning toward her. But before she could answer, the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. They all screamed, running toward the door and pulling at the handle. But it wouldn't budge. Uh, the lights flickered, casting the room in an eerie glow, 
and then they went out completely. The only illumination came from their flashlights, which flickered and dimmed. The sound of soft whispering filled the room, growing louder and more frantic. Emily's breath quickened as she scanned the darkness, her heart thudding in her chest. Suddenly, Claire let out a blood-curdling scream. Emily whipped her flashlight toward her friend and saw her being dragged toward the mirror by invisible hands. Claire clawed at the floor, but it was useless. Within seconds, she was pulled into the mirror, her body vanishing as if swallowed by the glass. Panic erupted. They pounded on the door, screaming for help, but no one could hear them. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, filling their heads with unintelligible words. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, everything stopped. The door swung open on its own. Mike, Danny, and Emily bolted from the room, racing down the stairs and out of the manor without looking back. They never spoke of what happened that night again. Claire was never found. The police conducted a search, but there was no trace of her, no evidence she had ever been inside the house. It was as though she had simply vanished. Years later, Emily still dreams about that night, about the figure in the mirror, about the whispers that never left her mind. She knows, deep down, that Hollow Creek Manor isn't just haunted. It's something far worse. And whatever took Claire is still there, waiting for its next victim. Story number two. Birchwood Asylum had been abandoned for nearly 50 years, standing at the edge of a decaying forest, its windows shattered and its walls overrun with vines. The once grand structure had become a symbol of forgotten misery, a place where the screams of the past were swallowed by time, or so people thought. But the stories never faded. Locals whispered about the patients who had died within its walls, the unspeakable experiments conducted in the name of medical progress, and the restless souls that supposedly roamed its dark corridors. One such story haunted the nearby town more than others. The legend of Room 42. It was said that one patient, a woman named Eleanor Foster, had died in Room 42 under suspicious circumstances. She had been admitted for severe mental illness, a young mother who claimed her newborn child had been taken by a shadow man in the middle of the night. No one believed her. Her husband had left her, the doctors labeled her delusional, and the staff grew weary of her incessant cries to find her child. She became violent, refusing to eat, scratching at her skin and shouting that they were coming for her. After just two months, Eleanor died, curled in the corner of room 42, her face frozen in terror. The official cause of death was listed as natural causes, but everyone who had seen her body knew it was something far worse. Years later, a group of paranormal investigators, three young men with a YouTube channel that specialized in exploring haunted places, decided to visit Birchwood Asylum. Their channel was gaining popularity and they believed this trip would make for perfect content. They had heard the story of Eleanor Foster and wanted to investigate room 42. Armed with cameras, digital recorders, and thermal imaging equipment, they set out for the asylum at dusk. The building was more imposing in person than they had imagined. Its crumbling facade loomed over them, casting long shadows across the overgrown lawn. They forced open the rusted front door, the screech of the hinges echoing down the hallway. Inside, the air was thick with mildew and decay, the smell of something long dead. Dust swirled in the weak beams of their flashlights as they walked cautiously through the first floor, filming the peeling wallpaper and rusted medical equipment left behind. It wasn't until they reached the second floor that things started to get strange. As they neared room 42, their equipment began malfunctioning. The cameras flickered, the temperature sensors dropped to freezing, and a sudden oppressive silence filled the air, as if the building itself was holding its breath. One of the men, Steve, felt a cold hand brush against the back of his neck, and he spun around, but there was no one behind him. The others laughed nervously, dismissing it as his imagination, but Steve's face had gone pale. I'm serious, he whispered. Something touched me. Ignoring his fear, they pressed on, finally reaching the door to room 42. The wooden door was splintered, and a faded number 42 was barely visible under layers of grime. One of the men, Josh, turned to the camera and grinned, trying to maintain his bravado. Here we are, folks, the infamous Room 42. Let's see if Eleanor wants to talk to us tonight. They pushed open the door and entered. The room was small and barren, with a single bed frame rusted through 
and a shattered window that overlooked the black forest beyond. They set up their equipment in the center of the room, placing digital recorders on the floor and using the thermal camera to scan the walls. At first, nothing happened. They asked the usual questions. Is anyone here? Eleanor, are you with us? But were met with silence. Then, as Josh began taunting whatever might be in the room, something unseen slammed the door shut with a deafening bang. They all jumped, spinning around to face the door, but it wasn't moving. The temperature plummeted, their breath now visible in the freezing air. The camera Steve was holding flickered before going black. Get the door open, Steve yelled, panic rising in his voice. But when Josh tried to turn the handle, it wouldn't budge. They were trapped. A faint sobbing sound filled the room, coming from the corner. They turned in unison, their flashlights shaking as they pointed toward the source of the noise. In the far corner of the room, the shadows seemed to thicken, growing darker, more substantial. And then they saw her. A woman crouched on the floor, her back to them. Her long, tangled hair draped over her thin, emaciated body. The sobbing grew louder, more desperate, and then she whispered, He took my baby. Josh, now shaking uncontrollably, took a step toward her. E. Eleanor, he stammered. The woman stopped crying. Her head twitched slightly as if she had heard him. Slowly, too slowly, she began to rise, her bones cracking audibly in the silence. Her head turned, just enough for them to see the side of her face, pale and gaunt, her eyes black pits of emptiness. He took my baby, she repeated, her voice raspy and cold. And now, he'll take you. Before any of them could react, the lights went out completely. The darkness was suffocating. Steve screamed, but the sound was cut short, replaced by the sound of something being dragged across the floor. Josh fumbled for his flashlight, but it wouldn't turn on. They could hear Steve's body being pulled toward the door, his shoes scraping against the floor in violent jerks. Then, the door creaked open on its own, revealing nothing but blackness beyond. We need to go, Josh yelled, grabbing the last remaining camera. He bolted for the open door, pulling the third man, Kyle, behind him. As they crossed the threshold, the crying stopped. The temperature rose instantly, and the oppressive atmosphere lifted. They ran down the hallway, not daring to look back, not daring to stop until they were out of the building, out of the forest, and back in their car. They never found Steve. When the police searched Birchwood Asylum, there was no sign of him, no sign of a struggle, nothing. Only the footage remained, and even that was corrupted, except for one brief clip. In the corner of the screen, just before the lights went out, a shadowy figure can be seen standing behind Steve, its long, black fingers reaching for his throat. Story the end. Story number three. The Haunting of Hollow Creek. In the quiet town of Hollow Creek, nestled between dense woods and steep hills, there stood an old abandoned house that the locals whispered about with a mix of fear and curiosity. The house, known as the Waverly Manor, had been empty for over 50 years, ever since a series of mysterious disappearances had led to its abandonment. The stories that surrounded it were chilling, enough to keep even the bravest souls at bay. Many claimed to have seen shadowy figures moving behind the cracked windows, and some reported hearing whispers carried by the wind on particularly quiet nights. The most famous story was that of Sarah Waverly, the last resident of the manor, who had vanished one stormy night without a trace. Some said she was taken by the spirits that haunted the house, while others believed she had simply run away. However, as the years went by, a sense of dread surrounded the manor, and no one dared to step foot inside. It was a cold October evening when a group of college students eager to test their bravery decided to explore the haunted Waverly Manor for themselves. There were four of them. Jake, the adventurous leader, Emily, the skeptic, Ryan, the scaredy cat of the group, and Mia, who was curious but cautious. They packed their flashlights, a camera, and a spirit box that Jake had insisted would help them communicate with any lurking spirits. As they approached the manor, the air grew heavier, and a thick fog rolled in, obscuring the moonlight. The manor loomed before them, its once grand structure now a decaying shadow of its former self. Vines crawled up the walls, and the door hung slightly ajar, creaking ominously in the wind. Are we really doing this? Ryan asked, his voice trembling slightly. Of course. We'll just take a quick look around. What's the worst that could happen? Jake replied, a grin plastered on his face. They stepped inside, the wooden floorboards creaking under their weight. 
dust particles danced in the beams of their flashlights, and the air smelled stale as if it had been trapped inside for decades. The group huddled together, their excitement mixed with a palpable tension. As they made their way through the dimly lit hallways, the atmosphere shifted. Every sound felt amplified. The rustle of leaves outside, the distant howling of the wind, and the echo of their footsteps. Emily rolled her eyes, trying to shake off the feeling of unease creeping up her spine. Guys, it's just an old house. There's nothing here, she said, her voice steady. But as they entered what appeared to be the living room, an eerie silence enveloped them. The room was filled with old furniture, draped in white sheets, and an old piano stood in the corner, staffed its keys yellowed with age. Mia approached it, drawn by an inexplicable urge. Do you think it still works? She asked, glancing back at the others. Before anyone could respond, she pressed down on a key, and a haunting note echoed through the room. Suddenly, the temperature plummeted, and a chilling breeze swept past them, extinguishing their flashlights. The darkness was suffocating, and a sense of panic set in. Jake, turn the flashlight back on! Emily yelled, her voice laced with fear. Trying! Jake replied, fumbling with the flashlight as he struggled to get it working. Just then, they heard a soft whisper, barely audible, but enough to send shivers down their spines. Get out! The voice was thin, almost childlike, and it seemed to emanate from the shadows surrounding them. Ryan's eyes widened, and he grabbed Mia's arm, pulling her back. Let's leave! This isn't funny anymore, he insisted, his voice shaking. Wait, let me try the spirit box, Jake urged, his curiosity outweighing his fear. He fished it out of his backpack and switched it on. The static crackled as he held it up. Is anyone here? He asked, his voice echoing in the silence. For a moment, nothing happened. But then, a distorted voice crackled through the speaker. Help me, Mia gasped, and the group exchanged fearful glances. Who are you? Jake pressed, his heart racing. Sarah, the voice whispered, sending chills down their spines. Is this a joke? Emily snapped, her skepticism wavering. No joke, the spirit box crackled again. I'm trapped. I can't leave. Just then, the lights flickered back on, illuminating the room. They turned to see the sheets on the furniture moving, as if someone was stirring beneath them. The temperature dropped further, and the air felt thick and suffocating. Suddenly, the piano began to play by itself, the keys moving as if an unseen hand was pressing them down. The haunting melody echoed through the house, and the whispers grew louder, a chorus of desperate voices calling for help. Let's get out of here, Ryan shouted, panic evident in his voice. He grabbed Mia's hand, pulling her towards the door. As they fled the living room, the whispers intensified, echoing in their ears. Stay. Don't go. Help me. Jake, still clutching the spirit box, hesitated, torn between fear and curiosity. We can't leave her, he shouted, trying to make sense of the chaos. Jake, she's gone. We have to leave now, Emily yelled, her voice filled with urgency. But before they could make it to the door, a shadowy figure emerged from the darkness. It was a young woman, her face pale and hauntingly beautiful, but her eyes were filled with anguish. Please, she whispered, her voice breaking. Help me. I'm trapped here. In that moment, time stood still. The group stood frozen, staring at the apparition before them. They felt the weight of her sorrow, and their hearts ached for her. Suddenly, a loud crash erupted from upstairs, breaking the trance. The group turned in unison, the instinct to flee kicking in. They sprinted towards the exit, fear propelling them forward. As they reached the door, they heard a final whisper that echoed through the halls. Don't forget me. They burst outside, gasping for breath as the cold night air hit their faces. The fog had lifted and the moon shone brightly above them. They didn't stop running until they reached the safety of their car parked on the roadside. As they drove away, the weight of what they had experienced hung heavily in the air. Jake turned to the others, his heart racing. What just happened back there? Emily shook her head, her skepticism shattered. I don't know, but I don't ever want to go back. Mia remained silent, staring out the window, haunted by the vision of the trapped spirit. They had entered Waverly Manor seeking a thrill, but what they found was a chilling reminder that some souls remain tethered to this world, forever searching for peace. The Waverly Manor still stands, an ominous silhouette against the night sky, its secrets buried within its walls. Locals continue to hear whispers in the wind and claim to see shadowy figures moving behind its cracked windows, a haunting testament to the souls that linger, forever trapped in the memories of a house long forgotten.
Story number four. It was a bitterly cold November night when James boarded the last train heading out of the city. The platform was eerily empty, and the silence hung in the air like a thick fog. James, an exhausted office worker, was eager to get home after a long day. He settled into a corner seat in the near-deserted train carriage, sighing as the warmth from the heating system slowly thawed his frozen limbs. He glanced around. There were only a few passengers scattered about. A man in a trench coat sat across the aisle, his hat pulled low over his face, seemingly asleep. A young woman sat near the door, nervously tapping her phone, her eyes darting up to glance at the other passengers now and then. Further down the carriage, an elderly lady clutched a shopping bag to her chest, her gaze fixed on the floor. As the train rumbled to life and began moving, James leaned his head against the window, letting the rhythm of the tracks lull him into a sleepy daze. His eyelids grew heavy, but just as he was about to drift off, the train jerked suddenly, jolting him awake. The lights flickered, casting strange shadows across the empty seats. He sat up straight, a sense of unease creeping over him. The train passed through the dark tunnels, the outside world a blur of inky blackness. James checked his phone. No signal, of course. That was typical for these late-night journeys, like he thought. His eyes wandered toward the man in the trench coat again. Something about him felt off. The way he sat so unnaturally still. The brim of his hat cast a shadow over his face, making it impossible to see his features. James shrugged it off. Maybe the guy was just a heavy sleeper. He turned his attention to the windows, watching the distorted reflections of the passengers in the dim light. But then something caught his eye, something that shouldn't be there. There, in the reflection of the glass, was another figure standing behind him. It was tall, unnaturally so, with gaunt limbs and hollow eyes that stared directly at him. His heart skipped a beat, and he spun around in his seat, expecting to see someone looming over him. But there was no one there. The seat behind him was empty, as it had been when he boarded. James felt his throat tighten. He looked back at the reflection, and the figure was still there, its hollow eyes boring into him. His heart pounded, and he quickly glanced around the carriage, hoping someone else had seen it too. But no one seemed to notice. The young woman was still tapping nervously on her phone, the old lady stared blankly ahead, and the man in the trench coat hadn't moved an inch. The train lurched again, and this time, the lights went out completely. Darkness swallowed the carriage, save for the faint emergency lighting that barely illuminated the space. A soft whisper echoed through the train, faint but unmistakable. James felt a chill run down his spine. The whisper was unintelligible at first, like the wind passing through a tunnel. But slowly, the words became clearer. Get off the train. James's hands tightened around the armrests. He swallowed hard, trying to tell himself it was just his imagination. The train was old, and maybe the noises were just mechanical. But then the whisper came again, louder this time, more urgent. Get off before it's too late. His pulse quickened. He looked at the other passengers, hoping for some sign that they were hearing it too. The woman at the door had stopped tapping her phone and was now staring straight ahead, her eyes wide with fear. The old lady clutched her bag tighter, her lips trembling as if she wanted to speak, but couldn't. And the man in the trench coat, he was still as stone, but there was something wrong about his posture. Something. Unnatural. James stood up, his legs shaky. He walked toward the door, his eyes darting nervously at the darkened carriage around him. As he passed the man in the trench coat, he caught a glimpse under the brim of the hat and froze. The man's eyes were wide open, but they weren't human eyes. They were pitch black, like deep, endless voids, and his mouth was twisted into a grotesque smile, showing too many teeth. James stumbled backward, gasping, but the man didn't move. He just sat there, staring with those awful, empty eyes. James turned and hurried toward the other end of the carriage, his mind racing. The whispers grew louder, echoing in his ears now. Get off the train! Get off! He reached the door, separating the carriages, but it wouldn't budge. He yanked on the handle, his breath coming in short, panicked bursts, but it was locked tight. He glanced back down the carriage, and that's when he saw it. Something moving in the darkness. It was the figure from the reflection. Tall, gaunt, and unnatural, it glided down the aisle toward him, its hollow eyes fixed on him with a predatory hunger. James's heart raced. He banged on the door, desperate for it to open, 
but it was no use. The train began to slow down, and through the window, James saw they were pulling into a station. Relief washed over him. He pressed the button to open the doors, but nothing happened. The station outside was dark and desolate. No one was there. The train came to a stop, but the doors remained firmly shut. He looked back down the aisle. The figure was getting closer, its bony fingers outstretched as if reaching for him. The whispers had grown deafening now, swirling around his head like a storm. With a desperate cry, James slammed his fists against the door one last time, and finally, with a hiss of air, it slid open. He tumbled out onto the platform, gasping for breath. The cold night air hit his face, and he scrambled to his feet, looking back at the train. The figure was standing in the doorway, watching him. Its hollow eyes glowed faintly in the darkness. For a moment, James thought it might follow him, but then the train's doors slid shut and the carriage moved on, disappearing into the blackness of the tunnel. James stood there, trembling, his heart pounding in his chest. The station was silent, empty. He had no idea where he was, but one thing was certain, he wasn't getting back on that train. Story number five. It all started with a phone call. Linda had been living in her quiet suburban home for just over a year. It wasn't the kind of place where strange things happened. The neighborhood was calm, the kind of place where children played in the streets and everyone knew each other's names. But that all changed as she got the call from her elderly neighbor, Mrs. Jensen. Linda, I don't want to alarm you. Mrs. Yen, uh, Jensen's frail voice trembled through the line. But I've been seeing someone in your attic window at night. I'm sure it's nothing, but... Well, just thought you should know. Linda laughed nervously. That's impossible, Mrs. Jensen. No one's up there. The attic is locked, and I don't even go up there myself. But her neighbor insisted, saying she'd seen a shadow moving behind the dusty window several times over the past few nights. After hanging up, Linda dismissed it as an overactive imagination. Mrs. Jensen was kind, but prone to worrying about things that weren't there. Still, that night, as Linda sat alone on her couch watching TV, she couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that something wasn't quite right. The house was silent, except for the occasional creak that old homes make. She tried to focus on the show, but her mind kept drifting back to what Mrs. Jensen had said. Someone in the attic? She brushed it off as paranoia. Yet, as the hours passed and the moonlight streamed through the windows, casting long shadows across the floor, Linda felt an overwhelming urge to check the attic for herself. Armed with nothing but a flashlight, she made her way up the narrow staircase to the second floor. The attic door was at the end of the hallway, an old wooden panel that hadn't been opened in months. Linda paused in front of it, her hand hovering over the doorknob. She could feel her heart pounding in her chest, and a cold sweat trickled down her back. She told herself she was being ridiculous, there was no one up there. She turned the knob. The door creaked open slowly, revealing a set of rickety wooden stairs that disappeared into darkness. The air was musty and thick, filled with the smell of old wood and forgotten memories. Linda hesitated at the bottom of the stairs, shining her flashlight up into the void. The beam cut through the gloom, illuminating boxes covered in dust, old furniture draped with sheets and cobwebs that clung to every corner. Nothing seemed out of place. She exhaled, relieved. Of course, there was no one up here. She was about to turn and leave when something caught her eye, a shape barely visible in the far corner of the attic. It looked like a figure crouching behind an old wardrobe. The flashlight beam wobbled as her hands began to shake. Linda froze, her breath catching in her throat. Hello, she called out, her voice barely above a whisper. There was no answer. She took a step closer, her shoes scraping against the dusty floor. The figure didn't move, but as she approached, she realized with a mix of terror and relief that it wasn't a person at all. It was an old mannequin, propped awkwardly behind the wardrobe. Its face cracked, and its eyes painted in a way that made it seem as though it were watching her. Linda let out a nervous laugh, scolding herself for being so jumpy. She turned to head back downstairs, her heart rate finally beginning to slow. But just as she reached the top of the stairs, she heard it. A soft, deliberate creaking noise, like the sound of footsteps moving across the floorboards. She spun around, her flashlight darting across the room, but there was nothing. The attic was just as it had been a moment ago, still, silent, empty. But the sound had been unmistakable, and now it was louder, closer. Someone or something was in the attic with her. 
Panic surged through her body and she bolted down the stairs, slamming the attic door shut behind her. She leaned against the wall, her heart racing. Linda knew she had to call someone, but who would believe her? Mrs. Jensen? The police? What would she even say? That she thought she heard footsteps in the attic. Her phone buzzed in her pocket, making her jump. It was a text from an unknown number. I've been watching you. Linda's blood turned to ice. Her hands trembled as she stared at the message, trying to comprehend what she was seeing. Her first instinct was that it had to be a prank, some sick joke. But how could anyone have known about the attic? Her thoughts spiraled into panic. Without thinking, she dialed the police. When the officers arrived, they conducted a thorough search of the house, including the attic. They found nothing. No signs of forced entry, no indication that anyone had been inside. They chalked it up to a possible prank or a misunderstanding and left Linda with a vague promise to keep an eye on the neighborhood. But that night, Linda couldn't sleep. She lay awake, staring at the ceiling, every small creak or gust of wind outside sending her heart into overdrive. At around 3 a.m., just as she was beginning to drift off, she heard it again, the soft creaking of footsteps above her moving slowly across the attic floor. Terrified, she grabbed her phone and sent a text back to the unknown number. Who are you? The reply came almost instantly. Check the closet. Her breath hitched. Uh, the closet was in her bedroom, just a few feet from where she lay. Slowly shaking uncontrollably, she turned her head to look at the closet door. It was slightly ajar. A sliver of darkness peered back at her. Summoning all her courage, she reached for the lamp on her bedside table and flicked it on. The closet door swung open wider with a creak. Her heart thundered in her ears as she saw what was inside. A figure stood in the shadows, staring at her, and then it moved. Story number six. In a small town surrounded by dense forests, an old oak tree stood at the edge of a forgotten cemetery. The townspeople called it the Old Oak, and it was as much a part of their folklore as the tales of haunted houses and restless spirits. This tree was ancient, its gnarled branches twisting towards the sky, and its roots seemed to grip the earth like skeletal fingers. According to local legend, it was said to be cursed, a portal between the living and the dead. Many years ago, a young girl named Clara had vanished from the town. The day she disappeared, a storm swept through, and townsfolk claimed to have seen her playing beneath the old oak just before she vanished. Search parties scoured the woods and the nearby river, but she was never found. The townspeople began to whisper that Clara had been taken by the spirits of the cemetery, bound to the old oak forever. As the years passed, strange occurrences were reported near the tree. People claimed to hear soft cries echoing in the night and to see shadowy figures darting among the tombstones. Some who dared to touch the tree said they felt a chill run through their bodies, while others described unsettling dreams of a girl with long dark hair calling out for help. Despite these warnings, a group of friends from the nearby city decided to visit the old oak one weekend, drawn by the legend and the thrill of the unknown. There were five of them, Mark, the leader of the group, Lisa, the skeptic, Ben, who believed in the supernatural, Sarah, a thrill seeker, and Tom, who was easily spooked but didn't want to seem cowardly. They arrived at the cemetery just as the sun began to set, casting eerie shadows that stretched across the grave markers. The old oak stood in the distance, its massive trunk looming over them like a guardian of secrets. The air was heavy, thick with anticipation. Let's get a picture by the tree, Mark suggested, raising his phone. Are you sure that's a good idea? Lisa replied, glancing nervously at the tree. They say it's cursed. Oh, come on, Lisa. It's just a tree, Ben laughed, dismissing her concerns. We're here for a story, right? They made their way to the tree, feeling the air grow colder as they approached. Its bark was rough and cracked, and a strange energy seemed to hum around it. As they gathered for the photo, Sarah reached out to touch the trunk. Do you guys feel that? She asked, her fingers brushing the rough surface. Feel what? Tom asked, his voice wavering. It's warm, Sarah said, frowning, almost like it's alive. Suddenly, the air turned frigid, and a gust of wind swept through the cemetery, sending leaves swirling around them. The friends huddled closer together, a sense of unease washing over them. Okay, let's just take the picture and go. Mark urged, trying to keep the mood light. They posed, and as Mark pressed the button, the camera flickered, capturing a strange distortion in the image. Did you see that? 
he exclaimed, showing them the screen. In the photo, behind the group, a faint outline of a girl appeared, her face twisted in despair. The color drained from their faces as they realized they weren't alone. Let's get out of here, Lisa said, her voice trembling. As they turned to leave, a soft whisper floated through the air. Help me. The group froze, their hearts racing. They looked at each other, panic setting in. Did you hear that? Tom gasped. It came from the tree, Ben exclaimed, stepping back instinctively. Stop it, guys. This isn't funny, Lisa snapped, trying to regain her composure. Ignoring her, Sarah took a step closer to the old oak, her curiosity overpowering her fear. What if we can help her, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Help who? Smark asked, exasperated. The girl! Clara! What if she needs us? Sarah replied, her eyes wide with determination. Before anyone could stop her, Sarah placed both hands on the trunk. The moment she made contact, a blinding light enveloped the tree and an ear-splitting scream echoed through the cemetery. The ground trembled beneath their feet as the roots of the old oak began to writhe, twisting and curling as if alive. Get her away from there, Lisa shouted, fear gripping her heart. Mark grabbed Sarah and pulled her back just as a shadowy figure emerged from the tree, coalescing into the form of a young girl. Clara's face was pale and anguished, her eyes wide with terror. Please, help me, she cried, reaching out toward them. The group stumbled back, fear overwhelming them. What do you want? Mark shouted, his voice breaking. Release me. I can't leave, Clara pleaded, her voice echoing with desperation. Suddenly, the ground beneath them split open, revealing a dark void filled with whispers and cries. The atmosphere grew thick with despair, and a sense of dread filled the air. The friends felt as if they were being pulled into the darkness, the tree's roots twisting around their ankles like icy hands. We have to go now, Ben shouted, grabbing Tom and dragging him away from the tree. As they ran, the whispers turned to screams, the sound of anguished souls trapped within the darkness. Clara's voice faded into the cacophony. Help me, don't leave me. They sprinted through the cemetery, not daring to look back. The echoes of the old oak faded as they reached the safety of their car. Breathless and shaken, they scrambled inside, slamming the doors shut. What the hell was that? Sarah gasped, her hands shaking. I don't know, but we're never coming back here, Lisa replied, her voice strained. As they drove away, the weight of what they had encountered settled over them. The old oak loomed in the rearview mirror, a dark silhouette against the twilight sky. The friends didn't speak of the encounter again, but the memory lingered, haunting their dreams. Some nights, they swore they could still hear Clara's desperate cries echoing in the wind, a chilling reminder of the souls forever bound to the cursed old oak. Years later, the town still whispered about the old oak, and those brave enough to venture near it spoke of a little girl's voice carried on the wind, forever pleading for release from her eternal prison. Story number seven. There's a place in Maple Brook that no one talks about. Everyone knows about it, but they refuse to speak its name. It's a relic of the town's dark past, an old asylum that had been abandoned for decades. Ivy choked its crumbling walls and the windows, broken and jagged, were like hollow eyes staring out over the forgotten landscape. Locals called it the Silent Room, though no one could say why, and no one dared go near it. But Nick was not like the others. He was a thrill seeker, always chasing the next rush. Ghost stories didn't scare him, and the old asylum was just another challenge. He'd heard the rumors, of course. People said strange things happened inside, voices in the walls, footsteps in empty hallways, and doors that slammed on their own. There were even stories about people who entered and never came back. But to Nick, these were just ghost stories made to scare kids. That's how he found himself standing in front of the asylum's rusted gates on a cold October night. His breath puffed out in little clouds as he scanned the imposing building before him. It loomed like a forgotten giant, its silence suffocating. His best friend Jenny had tried to talk him out of it. There's a reason no one goes there, she had said, her voice filled with concern. But Nick had brushed her off, determined to prove everyone wrong. The gate creaked as he pushed it open, and the sound echoed unnervingly in the still air. He turned on his flashlight and moved forward, the gravel crunching beneath his boots. The front door of the asylum hung slightly ajar, inviting him in. He hesitated for just a moment, glancing back at the empty street behind him, then stepped inside. 
The air inside the asylum was thick with dust and the stale stench of abandonment. His flashlight beam swept over the peeling wallpaper, revealing broken furniture, scattered debris, and graffiti left by trespassers over the years. He moved through the lobby and into the main hallway, his footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. The silence was oppressive. Nick had expected the usual sounds of an old building, creaks, distant bangs, maybe the scurrying of rats, but there was nothing. Not even the wind outside seemed to penetrate the asylum's thick walls. It was as though the building itself was holding its breath, waiting for, some, for something. He moved deeper into the asylum, passing what once might have been patient rooms, each one more decayed than the last. He had almost convinced himself that this was just an old, creepy building and nothing more when he saw something that stopped him in his tracks. At the end of the hall was a door. Unlike the others, this one was in perfect condition. No peeling paint, no broken hinges. It looked as though it had been untouched by time, pristine and solid. Above the door in faded gold lettering were the words, The Silent Room. A chill crept up Nick's spine. He hadn't expected this. It was one thing for locals to call the asylum the silent room, but to see it written like that, it felt wrong. His bravado wavered for the first time since he'd entered the building. But he wasn't about to turn back now. Taking a deep breath, he approached the door and tried the handle. It was locked. Nick cursed under his breath and stepped back, looking around for another way in. That's when he heard it. A soft whisper, barely audible, coming from behind the door. Help me. He froze, his heart pounding in his chest. He told himself it was just the wind, but deep down, he knew it wasn't. The whisper came again, clearer this time. Please, help me. Nick swallowed hard. Every instinct told him to leave, to run and never look back. But something compelled him forward. He kicked the door hard, and to his surprise, it swung open with a loud crash. The room beyond was completely different from the rest of the asylum. It was immaculate, like a time capsule. The walls were a pristine white, and the furniture, an old bed, a desk, a chair, was in perfect condition. A large mirror hung on the far wall, reflecting the faint glow of his flashlight. But the room was empty. No one was there. He stepped inside cautiously, his heart racing. The whisper had stopped, replaced by an unnerving silence. He turned slowly, scanning the room, but there was nothing out of place. Then his eyes landed on the mirror. At first, he didn't notice it. But then, slowly, something began to take shape in the reflection. A figure, pale and thin, standing just behind him. Nick's breath caught in his throat. He spun around, but the room was empty. When he looked back at the mirror, the figure was gone. His skin crawled with unease, and a cold sweat broke out on his forehead. He needed to leave. Now. As he turned to leave the room, the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. The sound reverberated through the walls, shaking the floor beneath him. He rushed to the door and pulled on the handle, but it wouldn't budge. He was trapped. Panic surged through him as the whispers returned, louder now echoing all around him. You shouldn't have come. Nick's hands shook as he banged on the door, screaming for help, but his voice was swallowed by the silence of the asylum. The whispers grew louder, more frantic, until they became a cacophony of voices, all speaking at once. Get out! Leave this place! You'll never leave! The room seemed to close in around him. The walls felt tighter, the air thinner. His head spun and his vision blurred as the voices filled his mind, pressing in on him from all sides. And then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw it. The figure was back in the mirror. This time, it was closer. Its face was pale, with hollow eyes and a twisted smile that sent chills down his spine. It stared at him, unmoving, and then, slowly, it raised a hand and pointed directly at him. Join us. Nick's breath hitched as the room grew colder, his body freezing in place. He tried to move, to scream, but his limbs felt heavy, as if something was holding him in place. The whispers swirled around him, pulling him deeper into the silence, into the dark. The last thing Nick saw was his own reflection, staring back at him from the mirror. But it wasn't him. It was the figure, smiling that terrible smile as everything around him went black. The next morning, the townspeople found Nick's car parked outside the asylum. The doors were unlocked and his flashlight lay discarded on the ground, but Nick was never seen again. Some say he became part of the silent room, one of the many souls trapped within its walls. Story number eight. It was well past midnight when Jenna's phone started to ring. She was curled up on her couch, drifting off in front of the TV. 
The soft glow of the screen was the only light in the room, casting flickering shadows on the walls. She groggily reached for her phone, not bothering to check the caller ID before answering. Hello? She mumbled, half asleep. There was silence on the other end. No breathing, no background noise, just dead air. Hello? She said again, a little louder this time. Still, no response. With a sigh, Jenna hung up, assuming it was just a wrong number or a prank. She set the phone down, pulled the blanket tighter around herself, and tried to focus on the late-night movie that was playing. But less than a minute later, the phone rang again. Jenna jumped this time, her nerves already frayed from being startled awake. She grabbed the phone, her fingers fumbling as she checked the screen. The caller ID showed a blocked number. Who is this? She demanded, trying to mask the unease creeping into her voice. Again, silence. This time, though, she waited. The silence felt heavy, as if someone or something was on the other end, listening, watching. A chill crept up her spine, and she felt an irrational sense of dread building in her chest. She hung up again, turning off the TV, and stood in the now-quiet apartment. The sudden stillness was suffocating, made the shadows around her darker and more oppressive. She decided to head to bed, hoping sleep would wash away the lingering anxiety. Just as she was about to leave the living room, her phone buzzed with a new text message. It was from the blocked number. I'm outside. Jenna's heart skipped a beat. Her hands shook as she stared at the message, her mind racing with possibilities. Was this someone playing a joke? One of her friends? But no one she knew would do something like this. Not at this hour. She rushed to the window, pulling the curtains aside just enough to peek through. The street outside was quiet and deserted, bathed in the pale glow of a street lamp. Nothing looked out of place. There was no one outside, but the uneasy feeling gnawed at her, a sense that she was being watched. The phone buzzed again. I see you. Her blood ran cold. She quickly closed the curtain and backed away from the window, her pulse racing. Whoever this was, they were watching her, and they knew she was looking out the window. Jenna frantically tried to call the number, but it went straight to voicemail. Blocking the number wasn't an option since it was already hidden. Taking a deep breath, she locked all the doors and windows in the apartment, her heart pounding as she double-checked each one. Maybe it was just someone messing with her, but deep down she knew it wasn't. The feeling of being watched hadn't gone away. It was getting worse. She decided to call the police. 911, what's your emergency? The dispatcher's calm voice was a relief. Jenna quickly explained what had happened, trying to stay calm. The dispatcher assured her they would send a patrol car to check the area and that she should stay inside, keep her doors locked, and wait for them. Uh, as she hung up, Jenna felt a little better knowing help was on the way. But the nagging feeling of dread still clung to her, like she wasn't alone in the house. She grabbed her phone again, checking it obsessively. Another message popped up. Too late. Jenna's breath caught in her throat. Too late? Too late for what? Her heart was pounding so hard she thought it might burst. She backed into the hallway, eyes scanning every corner of the dimly lit apartment, every shadow that seemed to shift and writhe as her anxiety grew. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed from the front door. She froze. Someone, or something, was inside. The footsteps were slow and deliberate, as if they wanted her to hear them. They moved across the hardwood floor toward her, each step echoing louder than the last. She stood paralyzed, her phone gripped tightly in her hand, her mind racing. There had been no sound of the door opening. No broken windows. How had they gotten inside? Another text message appeared. I'm closer now. Jenna couldn't breathe. The footsteps were approaching her bedroom, just down the hall from where she stood. Every instinct screamed at her to run, but where? The apartment was small, with nowhere to hide, nowhere to escape. The door was just down the hallway, but the footsteps were already between her and safety. She darted into the bathroom, slamming the door shut behind her and locking it. Her heart was thundering in her chest as she pressed her ear against the door, straining to hear any movement outside. The apartment was silent again. And then, the sound came. A soft tapping, just outside the bathroom door. The phone buzzed again in her hand, right outside. Tears welled up in her eyes as she backed away from the door, her mind spinning out of control. She was trapped. The police were coming, but what if they didn't make it in time? The tapping continued, slow and deliberate, as if the intruder was playing with her, enjoying the fear that was pulsing through every inch of her body. 
And then, as suddenly as it had started, the tapping stopped. For a moment, there was only silence. Jenna held her breath, barely daring to hope that whoever or whatever was out there had gone. She counted the seconds in her head, each one feeling like an eternity. Then the bathroom door creaked. It wasn't a knock. It wasn't forced. The door simply began to open, inch by inch, the lock sliding away as if it had never been there. Jenna's phone buzzed again. Her hands trembled as she looked down at the screen. I'm inside. The door swung open. Story number nine. In a quaint town with cobblestone streets and old brick buildings, there stood an antique shop known as the Curiosity Shop. It was a labyrinth of dusty shelves filled with forgotten treasures, ornate mirrors, old clocks, and mysterious trinkets. The shop was owned by an elderly woman named Mrs. Hawthorne, who had a reputation for being both kind and peculiar. Locals often said she could sense the history of every object, feeling the emotions tied to them as if they were alive. One rainy afternoon, a young woman named Lily stumbled into the shop, seeking shelter from the downpour. She had always been drawn to antiques and the stories they held, but, but today she felt an unexplainable pull toward a particular corner of the store. It was there that she found an old, ornate mirror, its frame intricately carved with floral patterns and strange symbols. The glass was slightly foggy, giving it an otherworldly appearance. Ah, I see you found the reflection of memories, Mrs. Hawthorne said, appearing beside her. Her voice was soft, yet there was an edge of urgency that caught Lily's attention. What do you mean? Lily asked, intrigued. This mirror shows not just your reflection, but your past. Your memories, Mrs. Hawthorne explained, her eyes glimmering with a mixture of caution and intrigue. But be wary. Some memories are best left undisturbed. Lily hesitated but couldn't resist the allure of the mirror. Can I try it? She asked, her heart racing with curiosity. Just remember, some reflections can reveal more than you're prepared to see, Mrs. Hawthorne warned. Lily stepped closer to the mirror, her breath fogging the glass. As she gazed into it, the world around her began to fade, and she found herself transported into a memory from her childhood, a sunny day spent in her grandmother's garden, surrounded by vibrant flowers and laughter. She smiled, overwhelmed by the warmth of the moment. But as the scene played out, a shadow began to creep into the corner of her vision. It was a dark figure, looming just beyond the garden. The joy of the memory twisted into something unsettling as Lily strained to see the figure more clearly. It was a man cloaked in shadow, his face obscured. He reached out a hand toward her, and the garden began to wilt, colors fading to gray. Get out! Lily shouted, pulling away from the mirror. She stumbled back, breathless, her heart pounding in her chest. The warmth of the memory had vanished, replaced by an icy chill that enveloped her. Did you see it? She gasped, looking at Mrs. Hawthorne, who watched her with an unreadable expression. Yes, the old woman replied quietly. You've seen the first reflection. It reveals the past, but it can also summon the darkness you've buried within. Lily's mind raced. What was that figure? I've never seen him before. Sometimes our memories hold on to shadows, things we try to forget. It could be a fear or a regret manifesting in the mirror, Mrs. Hawthorne explained. Can I try again? Lily asked, her curiosity overriding her fear. Mrs. Hawthorne sighed, concern etched on her face. You must be cautious. The more you look, the more it may reveal. Determined, Lily approached the mirror again. This time, she closed her eyes and focused, willing herself to see something different. As she opened them, the reflection shifted, transporting her to another moment. She was at her best friend's birthday party, surrounded by laughter and joy. But in the corner, the shadowy figure lingered again, watching her with an intensity that made her skin crawl. Leave me alone. Lily shouted, but the reflection continued, showing snippets of her life intertwined with the figure. Arguments, heartbreaks, moments of doubt. Each time the figure appeared, the joy of the memories turned sour, twisting into something grotesque. Desperate to escape, Lily pulled away from the mirror once more. What does it want? She cried, panic rising in her throat. It feeds on your fear and regrets, drawing strength from your memories, Mrs. Hawthorne said, her voice steady. You must confront it, or it will consume you. Confront it? How? Lily's mind raced with confusion and dread. Bar, face your darkest memory and accept it. Only then can you break the hold it has over you, the old woman advised. Summoning every ounce of courage, Lily returned to the mirror. She closed her eyes, 
allowing her mind to drift to the moment she dreaded the most, her grandmother's death. The scene unfolded, revealing a hospital room filled with sterile white light. Her grandmother lay frail and pale, whispering words of love and encouragement, even as her life slipped away. The shadowy figure stood in the corner, closer than ever, its dark energy pulsating with malice. Why didn't I save you? Lily choked out, tears streaming down her face. The figure drew nearer, its shadowy hand reaching out as if to pull her into the darkness. Stop! She yelled, her voice breaking. You don't control me. I loved her, and I couldn't change what happened. As she stood her ground, the figure recoiled, the darkness swirling around it. The room began to fade, the hospital light brightening until it enveloped the shadow entirely. Suddenly, Lily was back in the shop, gasping for breath. The mirror shimmered, and for a moment, she thought she saw her grandmother's warm smile reflected back at her. It's over, Mrs. Hawthorne said softly, her eyes filled with understanding. You faced your fear, and it has no power over you now. Lily's heart raced, but relief washed over her. She turned to thank Mrs. Hawthorne, but the old woman was nowhere to be found. The shop felt emptier, the air heavy with silence. As Lily made her way to the exit, she glanced back at the mirror one last time. The surface shimmered, and for a brief moment she thought she saw her grandmother standing beside her, a gentle smile on her face, before the image faded into the glass. Stepping out into the rain-soaked streets, Lily felt lighter. The weight of her past lifted. She had faced the darkness within and emerged victorious. But as she walked away, a soft whisper lingered in the air, echoing in her mind. A reminder that some memories would always remain, both beautiful and haunting. Story number 10. The town of Black Hollow had a secret. A secret hidden deep within the dense forest that surrounded it. For as long as anyone could remember, there had been stories of strange disappearances, eerie voices, and unexplainable events tied to the woods. Locals knew better than to venture too far in after dark, and those who did rarely spoke of what they experienced. Some never came back. Among the younger crowd, though, these stories were nothing but local superstition. That's why, one fateful weekend, a group of friends, Jason, Emily, Sarah, and Mark, decided to camp in Black Hollow Forest. They were city kids at heart, always chasing thrills, and the idea of spending the night in the infamous woods excited them. Ghost stories, they thought, were just tales for kids. They packed their gear, laughing off the warnings from the locals as they set out on the winding path through the trees. The day was crisp and the forest, though dense, had an almost serene quality to it. Birds chirped, leaves rustled in the breeze, and the smell of pine filled the air. They hiked for miles until they found a small clearing near a stream where they set up camp. By the time the sun began to set, they had a fire going and were joking around, sharing horror stories and roasting marshmallows. But as the daylight faded and the shadows stretched longer, the atmosphere began to change. The forest, which had been so welcoming during the day, now seemed different. The trees loomed like towering sentinels, their twisted branches reaching out like skeletal arms. The once lively sounds of the woods fell eerily quiet. I don't know about you guys, but this place feels strange, Sarah said, her voice quiet as she stared into the fire. Yeah, I'm getting a little creeped out too, Emily added, glancing nervously over her shoulder at the darkening woods. Jason, ever the skeptic, scoffed. Come on, don't tell me you're falling for those dumb stories. It's just a forest. Nothing's out there except maybe some deer. But as if on cue, a distant sound echoed through the trees a faint, almost indistinguishable whisper. It was so soft that at first, they weren't sure if they had actually heard it. The wind? An animal? Mark frowned and turned his head, listening. Did you guys hear that? Everyone fell silent, straining to listen. The whisper came again, clearer this time, as if carried on the breeze. It was a voice, faint but unmistakable, calling out from deep within the woods. Help me. The hair on the back of Jason's neck stood up. For a brief moment, his bravado faltered. Okay, that's a little freaky, he admitted, glancing around nervously. Emily hugged her knees to her chest. Do you think someone's out there? Maybe it's just someone messing with us, Mark said, though he didn't sound convinced. The whisper came again, louder, closer. Help me, please. Without thinking, Sarah stood up. What if someone's hurt? We have to check. No way, Jason said, standing and grabbing her arm. We're not going out there. You don't just follow random voices in the woods. 
But Sarah shook him off, grabbing a flashlight. What if it's real, Jason? What if someone needs help? Against their better judgment, the group grabbed their flashlights and ventured toward the source of the voice. The forest swallowed them as they left the safety of the fire. The darkness was thick, the kind that seemed to press in on them from all sides, and the silence was deafening, broken only by the occasional crack of a branch beneath their feet. They followed the whispers deeper into the woods, their flashlights casting long, flickering beams of light through the trees. The voice was growing louder now, more desperate. Please, help me. They came upon a clearing, but something was wrong. The air here felt different, heavier, colder. In the center of the clearing was an old, crumbling well, its stones covered in thick moss. The whispering seemed to come from within the well, echoing up from its depths. Mark shined his flashlight into the well, but the beam didn't reach the bottom. It was impossibly deep. I don't like this, he muttered, stepping back. Jason shook his head. This is crazy. We need to get out of here. But before anyone could move, the whisper changed. It wasn't a cry for help anymore. It was laughing, a low, sinister chuckle that sent chills racing down their spines. Sarah stumbled backward, her flashlight flickering as the laughter echoed louder, filling the air around them. What the hell is that? The ground beneath their feet trembled and the wind picked up, swirling through the trees. The laughter grew louder, more twisted, as shadows moved at the edge of the clearing. Shadows that didn't belong to trees. Jason's heart pounded in his chest. Run! They turned and bolted, racing through the woods, branches whipping at their faces as the wind howled around them. The laughter followed, rising into a cacophony that filled the night. The whispers were everywhere now, wrapping around them, filling their heads with unintelligible words. Emily screamed as something cold, brushed against her arm, but when she looked, there was nothing there. It's right behind us, she cried, but no one dared to look back. They stumbled through the darkness, trying to find their way back to camp, but the forest seemed different now, unfamiliar, twisted. The trees closed in, the path they had taken earlier no longer visible. Finally, they burst into the clearing where their campfire still flickered weakly, but their sense of relief was short-lived. The fire was nearly out, and the clearing, it wasn't the same. The air was still, unnaturally so, and the trees surrounding them were no longer the familiar pines they had passed earlier. These trees were ancient, gnarled, and seemed to lean in toward them. Mark's breath came in ragged gasps. This isn't right. We didn't go this far. Before anyone could respond, the whispers returned, louder now coming from all directions. Stay with us forever. Suddenly, the campfire flared up, casting long, dancing shadows across the clearing. In the firelight, they saw them, figures standing just beyond the light. Dozens of them, pale and hollow-eyed, their faces twisted in agony, mouths moving in silent whispers. Emily backed up, her voice shaking. We need to leave. Now. But as they turned to run, the figures stepped forward, closing in. The forest itself seemed to shift, the trees moving like living creatures, blocking their path. The air grew thick, suffocating, and the whispers became a deafening roar. Jason's flashlight flickered out, plunging them into complete darkness. The last thing he saw before the light vanished was the pale grinning face of one of the figures reaching out for him with cold skeletal fingers. And then, silence. The next morning, the town of Black Hollow was abuzz with news of the missing campers. Search parties scoured the woods for days, but no trace of Jason, Emily, Sarah, or Mark was ever found. Their campsite was discovered, abandoned, with the fire still smoldering, but the forest offered no answers. As the years passed, their names were added to the long list of those who had vanished in Black Hollow Forest, becoming just another chapter in the town's whispered legend. But some say that if you stand at the edge of the woods on a quiet night, you can still hear their voices calling out from the darkness, lost forever in the whispers of the woods. Story number 11. In the heart of a sleepy little town stood Ashwood House, an old Victorian mansion with a dark past. The townsfolk whispered about the strange occurrences that plagued the house, recounting tales of eerie lights flickering in the windows at night, ghostly figures appearing in the gardens, and the unsettling sound of piano music drifting through the air when no one was inside. The story of Ashwood House began many years ago when it was home to a reclusive musician named Edgar Ashwood. Edgar was known for his brilliant compositions, but was rumored to be deeply troubled. 
After the tragic death of his wife, Lily, he became a recluse, abandoning the outside world and pouring his grief into his music. The townspeople often spoke of hearing his melancholic piano playing late into the night, but it abruptly stopped one stormy evening when Edgar himself vanished without a trace. After Edgar's disappearance, the house fell into disrepair and, and eventually it was abandoned. Some believed Edgar's spirit lingered, bound to the home he had loved so dearly. As, as the years passed, Ashwood House became a place of curiosity and fear, and no one dared to enter, believing it was haunted. One stormy evening, a group of college friends, Sarah, Mark, Jenna, and Tom, decided to explore the legendary Ashwood House for a thrilling night of ghost hunting. Equipped with flashlights and a camera, they approached the imposing structure, its paint peeling and windows cracked, giving it an even more foreboding presence. As they stepped inside, the air felt thick with an unsettling energy. Dust motes danced in their flashlights, and the floor creaked beneath their feet as they explored the dark, cavernous rooms filled with old furniture draped in white sheets. The atmosphere was heavy, and an eerie silence enveloped them, broken only by the sound of the rain beating against the windows. Let's check out the music room, Jenna suggested, her eyes sparkling with excitement. The others followed, a mix of fear and anticipation coursing through them. They found the room where Edgar was said to have played his haunting melodies. A grand piano sat in the center, its keys yellowed with age and dust. Tom ran his fingers over the keys, producing a discordant sound that echoed in the silence. Stop it! You'll wake the ghosts! Mark joked nervously, trying to lighten the mood. But as soon as the words left his mouth, a chilling breeze swept through the room, making the temperature drop significantly. Did you feel that? Sarah asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, it's freezing, Tom replied, rubbing his arms for warmth. Suddenly, the lights flickered, and they all froze, exchanging nervous glances. Mark turned on the camera, hoping to capture something supernatural. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Jenna, start asking questions, he instructed. Jenna nodded, her heart pounding with excitement and fear. Is anyone here with us? We mean you no harm, she called out, her voice echoing in the stillness. For a moment, there was nothing but silence. Then, faintly, they heard the distant sound of piano music playing, a soft, sorrowful melody that sent chills down their spines. It's the piano, Sarah gasped, her eyes wide. Stop messing around, Tom, Mark said, half-jokingly, but he couldn't hide his unease. I'm not touching it. Tom insisted, stepping back. The music grew louder, filling the room with a haunting beauty that was both captivating and terrifying. Suddenly, the piano keys began to move on their own, playing a melody that echoed with an almost palpable sorrow. The friends stood frozen in disbelief, the, the realization of what they were witnessing sending a wave of terror through them. Get out! We need to go now! Jenna shouted, her voice rising in panic. But before they could turn to leave, the door slammed shut, trapping them inside. Let us out! Mark yelled, pounding on the door, but it wouldn't budge. The music continued to play, and the air thickened with an oppressive presence. The friends turned back to the piano, which now seemed to glow with an otherworldly light. Shadows flickered around them, swirling in the corners of the room like dark mist. Edgar, Jenna called out, her voice trembling. Is that you? In response, the music abruptly stopped, plunging the room into silence. An eerie stillness enveloped them, and then they heard a voice, soft and mournful. Help me. Did you hear that? Sarah whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Who are you? Jenna asked, her voice quivering. I am lost. The voice echoed, sorrowful and longing. I cannot leave. The room grew colder, and the shadows danced closer. The friends huddled together, their breaths visible in the frigid air. We have to help him, Jenna said, determination replacing her fear. Help him? How? Tom asked, panic rising in his voice. Maybe we can play a song, Jenna suggested. He was a musician. If we can play something he would recognize, maybe it will set him free. Are you insane? Mark replied, but the look in Jenna's eyes left no room for doubt. She approached the piano, her fingers trembling as she placed them on the keys. What should I play? She asked, looking back at the others. Play his most famous piece, Sarah said, recalling the stories she had heard. The one about loss. Jenna took a deep breath and began to play. As the notes filled the air, a strange energy pulsed through the room. The shadows around them began to swirl and the temperature dropped even lower, making it hard to breathe. As she played, the voice returned, stronger now. 
Remember? Me, it pleaded, and the room seemed to vibrate with its sorrow. Suddenly, the piano erupted with a brilliant light, and the shadows began to writhe violently. The friends clung to each other as the light grew brighter, almost blinding. Jenna continued to play, tears streaming down her face as she felt Edgar's pain wash over her. In that moment, the figure of a man emerged from the shadows, his face filled with anguish and longing. It was Edgar, his ghostly form translucent and shimmering. He reached out towards Jenna, the sorrow in his eyes palpable. Release me, he whispered, and the room trembled as if the house itself was alive with energy. With one final surge of strength, Jenna poured her heart into the melody, and the room exploded with light. A deafening roar filled the air, and then, just as suddenly as it had begun, everything fell silent. The light dimmed, and the friends stood there, panting, the piano still. Edgar's figure faded, and for the first time they felt a profound peace in the air, as if a heavy weight had been lifted from the house. The door creaked open slowly, revealing the outside world. The rain had stopped, and the moon shone brightly in the night sky. I think, I think we did it, Sarah breathed disbelief in her eyes. We freed him, Jenna said, her voice a mix of relief and exhaustion. As they stepped outside, the air felt lighter, and the shadows of Ashwood House no longer seemed menacing. The town might still speak of the haunting, but the weight of the past had been lifted. Edgar Ashwood was finally free, and his spirit could finally rest. From that day on, the music of Ashwood House transformed from haunting to beautiful, a melody of release echoing through the winds of the town, a reminder that even in darkness, there is always a way to find peace. Story number 12. The town of Willow Creek had its share of ghost stories, but none were as notorious as the legend of the Old Lake House. Tucked deep in the woods, away from the main road, the abandoned house overlooked a dark, stagnant lake that locals swore was cursed. Few dared to go near it, and fewer still returned with their minds intact. The story was always the same, a shadow at the lake that seemed to watch from the water's edge, waiting for someone foolish enough to come close. One summer evening, three friends, Mark, Rachel, and Kevin, decided to visit the lake house. They had heard the stories all their lives and wanted to see for themselves if there was any truth to the rumors. It had become almost a rite of passage for local teenagers to test their courage by spending the night near the cursed lake. As they drove deeper into the woods, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an eerie glow over the treetops. The path to the lake was barely visible now, overgrown with weeds and branches that clawed at the sides of their car. Rachel, sitting in the passenger seat, looked uneasy. I don't like this, she said softly, staring out into the thickening darkness. I've heard too many stories about this place. Mark, always the skeptic, scoffed. They're just stories. People let their imaginations run wild. We'll be fine. Kevin in the back seat had, was silent. He had been the most eager to come, but now that they were getting closer, he felt a cold knot of dread twisting in his stomach. He didn't believe in ghosts or curses, but something about this place felt wrong. When they finally reached the lake house, the sky had turned a deep indigo. The structure loomed ahead, decayed and crumbling, with its windows shattered and the roof half collapsed. The dark water of the lake behind it shimmered faintly in the moonlight, utterly still. This is it, Mark said, parking the car. Let's check it out. They climbed out, flashlights in hand, and made their way toward the lake. The air was thick with the smell of damp earth and rotting wood, and the only sound was the distant croaking of frogs. The house seemed to watch them with hollow, broken windows as they approached. Look at this place, Kevin said, his voice hushed. It's falling apart. Who would have lived here? Mark shrugged. Probably some old recluse decades ago. People make up ghost stories because it's easier than facing the fact that no one cared about them. As they walked closer to the lake, Rachel's flashlight flickered. She smacked it against her palm and it stayed on. But a sense of unease settled over her. Suddenly, Kevin stopped dead in his tracks. Do you see that? He whispered pointing toward the water. The others followed his gaze. At the edge of the lake, just where the water met the shore, a figure stood, tall and thin, shrouded in darkness. It was barely visible in the dim light, more of a silhouette than a person, its outline jagged and unnatural, as if it were a part of the shadows themselves. Is someone out there? Rachel asked, her voice trembling. Mark squinted, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. It's probably just a trick of the light, 
he said, though he didn't sound convinced. But Kevin wasn't so sure. His eyes were locked on the figure, and the longer he stared, the more certain he became that it was looking right at them. He felt a deep, instinctual fear bubbling up inside him, and before he could stop himself, he turned and began walking back toward the car. We need to go, Kevin said, his voice shaking. Now. Wait, what? Mark laughed nervously. We just got here. But Kevin wasn't listening. I'm serious. We need to get out of here. Something's wrong. Rachel, sensing the fear in Kevin's voice, glanced back at the figure by the lake. It hadn't moved, but the air around it seemed to ripple as though the darkness itself was alive. Without another word, she followed Kevin. Mark stayed behind, staring at the shadow, his skepticism fighting against the rising terror in his chest. It's just a trick of the light, he shouted after them, though he wasn't so sure anymore. The figure seemed closer now, even though it hadn't moved. Kevin and Rachel reached the car, and Kevin fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking as he tried to unlock the door. Come on, Mark, Rachel yelled, her eyes wide with panic, but Mark couldn't move. His feet felt rooted to the ground as the shadow at the lake seemed to drift toward him, its form growing taller, darker, more defined. Uh, the air around him grew cold, and the stillness of the lake seemed to pulse, like something massive was stirring beneath its surface. Suddenly, a low, guttural sound echoed across the water like a growl, but not from any animal they had ever heard. It was deep, otherworldly, vibrating in the very air around them. Mark, Rachel screamed. That broke the trance. Mark spun around and bolted for the car, his heart hammering in his chest. The growl grew louder, and he could hear the crunch of leaves behind him, as if something enormous was following, moving just at the edge of the shadows. They all scrambled into the car, and Kevin floored the gas pedal, tires spinning in the dirt as they sped away from the lake. None of them dared to look back. The drive back to town was silent, the weight of what they had experienced pressing down on them like a suffocating blanket. When they finally reached the safety of civilization, they parked under a streetlight and sat in stunned silence, unable to speak. What was that? Rachel finally whispered, her voice shaky. Kevin shook his head, still gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. I don't know, he said, but it wasn't human. Mark stared out the window, still trying to process what had happened. It was just shadows, he muttered, though his voice was hollow as if he didn't even believe himself anymore. But deep down, they all knew the truth. The figure at the lake wasn't a trick of the light. It wasn't a shadow or an illusion. It was something much older, something far darker than any of them could have imagined, and whatever it was, it was watching them.